you make no other prayer than that, have your way in me. Let that be the one prayer you make. And it will be enough. This is an Aloha Sunday. The last Sunday of every month is Aloha Sunday here, and we always speak to some ancient Hawaiian proverb. These proverbs were collected in a book called Olelo Noeau, written by Dr. Mary Kavena Pukui. We look at one of those proverbs every Sunday to find that place where the spiritual truth that the Hawaiians knew and the spiritual truth that we know come together so we can feel more connected with this land and the people. The one that I have selected for today to me is fundamental in our own belief system. And it's this. Elave ike ao o ma lama. Ai oi mau kana wau. Elave means to take. Ike ao means the knowledge. A ma lama is to keep sacred, to keep precious. Ai oi is a, is a word meaning the best. You may have heard that phrase. Maui no ka oi. Oi means the best. Maui is the best. Mau means many. Kanawau is the knowledge and wisdom. Na'awau. In fact, the book is Olelo Na'awau, which means wisdom sayings. So what it kind of means in English, according to Dr. Pukui, is this. He who takes his teachings and applies them increases his knowledge. In unity, we have five fundamental spiritual beliefs. And the last one is action. And it says essentially, as my mother used to say, being from the South, that if you don't do that one, then the rest of them don't amount to a hill of beans. <laughs> so all the spiritual knowledge that we may take and accumulate in this world, it don't mean nothing if you don't put it into action. And that's kind of what this phrase is all about. Taking what's up here and putting it into our lives and making it work. And isn't that always the struggle? We know the truth. We come here every Sunday, we all know it. We all do, including me. We know it, but we don't always live it. We don't always put it into our life. And that's what this is about. And it's incredibly important. This is maybe my most favorite quote from Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity. He said that man receives first an intellectual understanding of truth, which he transmits to his heart, where love is awakened. The Lord reveals to him that the faculty of love is the greatest of all the powers of man and that head knowledge must decrease as heart understanding increases. In other words, all that head knowledge that we're learning don't amount to a hill of beans <laughs> until we move it into the heart where then we have access to the greatest of all men's powers. Remember when Jesus gave us the greatest commandments of the world, he said you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and your mind, and you are to love your neighbors yourself. He didn't say you are so supposed to study the Lord your God with all your heart. You are supposed to memorize all of the principles and all the truths. He didn't say any of those things. He talked about love. He talked about love. We get stuck up here. The Hawaiians have a word for that, ku. Ku is frequently meaning the soldier at attention. It means firm and fixed. I am ku in this. I am ku. And we get our ku thoughts up here. We get lots of ku thoughts, like I'm right and you're wrong. I love that ku thought. <laughs> I'm right. I know the truth and you don't. We get lost in that ku-ness and we need to become olu olu. Olu olu. Can you say that? Olu, olu, good. Turn to your neighbor and say it. Be careful. Olu, olu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the lip action is kind of cool on that. <laughs> olu, olu. Olu, olu means exactly the way it kind of sounds. It means gentle and kind. We often use it with describing people's personalities. Oh, he has such an olu, olu personality. Such a gentle and kind. We need to soften this so that the movement of all this great knowledge we're learning can come down to the source of great softness in our hearts. <laughs> it's, no, it's no mistake that we call this pa in the po'o. We get hard head. Pa in the po'o, hard head. But then the heart is olu olu, is soft. Yeah. That knowledge needs to move from here to here. The, the Apostle James talks about it in his letter in the, in the Christian scriptures. He said the full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. 
It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God not by a barren faith, but by a faith in fruitful works? In other words, to be made right with God, to be in alignment with God is not just to know it up here, but to move it here and to have it into our life. In Buddhism, in the precious garland, it says even three times a day to offer 300 cooking pots of food does not match a portion of the merit required in one instant of love. And so it's not even the actions, but it's the love that comes in that. I'm so proud that this church feeds 150 homeless people every Monday. I'm so proud that we feed all the people who live at the Gregory House Residential Treatment Facility. I'm so proud that our kitchen does all this amazing service. But none of it would mean anything if it was not done with love, and it is. If you don't know that, show up here at 5 o'clock, show up on the beach at 5 o'clock and feel it. They don't do it because it's an obligation. They don't do it because I asked for it. They don't do it because they don't get paid for it. They do it for love. You can feel it and you can see it. And if you want to know what that feels like, you can join them and you can find out because it is beautiful. Rahab's one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. She was a harlot. I can identify. <laughs> she was a senten wanton strumpet. As Shakespeare would say, she was a loose woman. I like that because what happened in the end of the story, I'll tell you, the end is that she became like God loved her. She was favored, so it feels like I have hope. <laughs> if God could love her. She lived in Jericho, the famous city that was going to be torn down. She was a harlot in Jericho. She ran a brothel, essentially. Now, Joshua was beginning to tear down the city, and he sent some spies in, a couple of spies to kind of check things out. And they were being, they were being sort of uh, discovered by the guards. And Rahab, the madam of her little cubicle there, hid them because she knew they were good people and they were after something good. So she hid them under some flax. And it was a dangerous thing, but she did. And she saved them. And they left. But when they left, they said, Honey, when we tear this city down, I don't mean to pick on you personally, personally <laughs> but, you have, but you have kind of red hair. And Rahab had red hair, so I'll pick you. <laughs> they said to her, Honey, we don't care where you've been or what you've done. You are beautiful because you have put what you know into action. And so when all of Jericho and the walls fell down, guess who survived? The only one who survived in the entire city when it was destroyed. Rahab, the happy hooker. <laughs> <laughs> she was the one. That gives me hope. <laughs> It gives me great hope. So I love that. And in the book of James, he actually writes about it and he actually confirms what I'm telling you. Second chapter, he says, the same Rahab, the Jericho harlot. See, I'm not making this up. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? A seamless unity of believing and doing. That's what counted with God. On my desk, I have a stone like this. I couldn't find the exact one this morning. It's in a box. I took a stone like this and I decoupaged it. You know what decoupaging is, right? I decoupaged it with, oh, God forgive me, scripture. I decoupaged it with scripture and I put it on my desk to remind me that even if we throw a stone wrapped up in scripture, we are still throwing a stone. And it hurts. That should never, ever be our intention with scripture. Do you hear that? I don't care what deep and powerful beliefs you may have about scripture. We should never, ever wrap them in a stone and throw them at people. It hurts. And that is not the intention of God's word. And that's the way it was with Rahab. They could have thrown stones at her, but they didn't. They knew the truth. 
And of course, my most favorite example of that is found in the story of the prodigal son, where he took everything and he went off and he squandered it on, on what the Bible calls riotous living, which is proper terminology for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And in the 15th chapter of the book of Luke, he decides he has to come to his senses and he does. In the 15th chapter, he says he was so hungry we would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. Boy, he was, he was, he was homeless, he was broke. It's so typical of a 19-year-old. <laughs> that brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I am going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against God, and I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. And then there's a period, and then there's a little white space, and then there's a sentence that says, he got right up and went home to his father. Now... You need to know, so much of life happens in that white space between that period where he knows what to do and he does it. Do you know that space? Where I know what I should do, I've got to do this, I've got to get out of this abusive relationship, I've got to stop this life of addiction, I've got to stop this crazy job, I've got to stop this pattern of dysfunctional behavior, I've got to, and then we do it. Sometimes there's years in that space. Yeah. I have spent years in the white space. I think it's fascinating that the white space is nothing is talked about. That's so much of the drama of life. And you know what? It doesn't look like scripture pays any attention to that. It's like, okay, good. You just have your little drama. But when you're done and you get ready to do the right thing, we'll write about it. Otherwise, folks, it don't mean nothing. That white space is that place in between knowing what we need to do and doing it. That white space. How do we make that shift? How do we do it? Well, number one, we have to reflect. We have to think about what we know. Think about the coup thoughts that you know. The coup thoughts means those fixed ones that are good. Not all coup thoughts are bad. What coup thoughts can you think of in your life regarding your spiritual growth and your spiritual relationship with God that are true? Let me give you a hint. God is my source. I want to be coup with that. I want to be totally coup with that thought. I don't want anybody to shake me from that. What else? What do you have? I am in the right place at the right time right now. I want to be coup with that. Coup meaning fixed and firm forever. What else do you have? But... I am a vessel for God's love. How beautiful is that? I want to affirm that at every moment. I want to be cool in that, too. What else? I am an instrument of your peace. How beautiful is that? To be cool in that and to walk around with that kind of coolness? That is beautiful. In Spanish, I learned one. Yo tengo un padre con parqueta profundo. I have a rich father with deep pockets. <laughs> See? Yo tengo uno padre rico con paqueta profundo. Yeah. I want to be cool in that, too. <laughs> These are the wonderful cool thoughts, and we need to hold on to them. So reflection, remembering them is really important and reflecting on them. And that reflection brings us some amazing insight because, yeah, we kind of know it, we kind of know it, but we need to think about it. And I want to show you what happens when we think about it. You might want to remember this in case you're not sure about how powerful just reflection is. In the 119th Psalm, oh, how I love all you've revealed. I reverently ponder it all day long. Your commands give me an edge. They never become obsolete. I've become even smarter than my teacher since I've pondered and absorbed your counsel. I've become wiser than the wise old sages simply by doing what you tell me. I watch my step, avoiding the ditches and the ruts. With your instruction, I understand life. What an amazing gift. Just from the pondering, 119th Psalm. Think about it when you need to remember, I have to ponder this and find out the jewels that come 
from the pondering. Here's an affirmation for you to make about that. Today, I ponder about what I think I know. Can you do it? <laughs> what I think I know. Because my <laughs> the caveat is tomorrow it may change because more is always going to be revealed. We will always learn more. But this we can do today. We must ponder about it. Today I ponder about what I think I know. Say it. Today I ponder about what I think I know. Okay? You're going to do that today. You're going to think about it. Do it in the morning. Do it at night. Second thing is affirmation. We need to affirm what we think we know. Now that seems kind of simple, but let me tell you, Ernest Holmes, the founder of Religious Science, wrote one of the greatest things that I've read about affirmation. You know, we always talk about the power of affirmation, but he talks about it in a really wonderful way. He said, strange as it may seem, the human thought can affirm only. We can only affirm. It can never deny, for even at the moment of denial, it really affirms the presence of that which it denies. Oh, there is a catch-22. Do you understand what he's saying? There's no such thing as denial. It's all affirmation. Even when we think it's a negative thing, all we're doing is really affirming the power of that negative thing. Oh, my God. He said, we speak of denials and affirmations as though they were opposed to each other, but such is not the case. Fear and faith are but different ways of expressing positive beliefs about something. Fear is a positive belief that we will experience something that we do not wish to happen. Fear is a positive belief that we're going to experience something that we don't want to happen. Well, now that's a little scary. While faith is a positive belief that we will experience something that we do wish to have happen. The nature of being is such that real denial is impossible, for there is only one mind in the universe, and it is always saying yes and amen to whatever we are saying. We are constantly affirming our way through life. And since affirmation is the only mental action possible, it behooves us to find the greatest of affirmation and use them. <laughs> oh, we have to be so careful what we speak because that is what is going to be created for us. That's hugely important. Now, today I affirm the truth of what I know, and how are we going to do that? How are we going to? Are we just going to say, today I affirm the truth? Put it on a mirror in a post note. My, my exhortation to you is to take charge of making that affirmation and putting it into action. And there are tremendous ways to do that. There's a member of this congregation that in a very simple way, she's confined to a wheelchair, but she makes these little things and gives them away to the people who care for her and who she loves. And they say, there is no greater wisdom than kindness. This is her affirmation. She gives it away. I have a friend in Los Angeles who is starting a new, a new thing among his friends. He texts people every morning an affirmation, and then throughout the day, they text him back. Every day he does this. Today, he sent this one. I am filled with excitement knowing that this day is unlike any other I have encountered and presents unique opportunities for healing and spiritual unfoldment. And then all those people who receive it will text him one. And so his day is flooded with these amazing affirmations every single day. I know people who are doing this on Facebook. Go look on Facebook. See, there are people who are texting things on Facebook. There is a million ways that we can take affirmations, but I'm saying we have to take action. We can't just know it. We need to start putting these truths out, not only for ourselves, but for others. And so here's the affirmation I want to give to you. Today, I affirm the truth of what I know. I affirm the truth of what I know. Together, today, I affirm the truth of what I know. And by affirm it, I don't mean just know it, but I mean put it into action. Write it on your checkbook. Put G-I-M-S on the bottom of every check, which means God is my source. So you don't forget. And so when the person who cashes your check and says, what is this for? You say, it means God is my source. And you have an opportunity to spread that affirmation to someone else. That's the power, you see. And the last one is action. I want you to know that this is, this is an amazing scripture. I haven't read it to you before. And I have no idea why, because to me it is so powerful. 
It's about a simple story in, in the Gospel of Matthew, a very short story. There were two blind men that wanted to be healed, and they came to Jesus. And it says here in the ninth chapter, 17th verse, as Jesus left the house, he was followed by two blind men saying, Mercy, son of David, mercy on us. And Jesus got home. The blind men followed him in. And he said to them, Do you really believe I can do this? And they said, Why, yes, Master. And here's where it gets good for us. Remember that Jesus represents that amazing consciousness of God. It says, he touched their eyes and he said, become what you believe. And then two short sentences. It happened. They saw. Become what you believe. What an amazing commandment. Become what you believe. It sums up everything. Whatever it is we think we're believing up here, we need to become that. So my affirmation for you is today I take action to demonstrate what I know in my heart. Try to say it. Today I take action. And let's do it simpler. Let's do it the way Jesus said it. Today, I become what I believe. Together. Today, I become what I believe. And that's what this whole Hawaiian proverb is about. Taking the belief up here and becoming it in our bodies and in our lives. Will you close your eyes with me, please, for just a moment? The great teacher of all is within us. The great one who calls us to become what we believe is within us now. Saying, loosen those cool thoughts, become olu olu, and become what you believe. In these quiet moments, I invite you to make that holy connection with the one who can change everything in you. As we come to God together in the sacred and holy silence.